Today I'd like to introduce uh, my co-chair of the Canadian Peace Alliance, Derek O'Keefe, and among his other activities beyond the Canadian Peace Alliance, he is a leading organizer with Stop the War Vancouver, he's the former editor of Rabble, and he's the co-author of Malalai Joya's uh, most recent book. Thank you so much, uh, Soraya. Uh, thank you, Judith. Uh, it's great to see everyone here, familiar faces, and, and lots of unfamiliar ones as well. That's always good. Uh, it means we've got new energy and, and new people coming into the movement. Um, it, just listening to Soraya just now, um, you know, the CBC just did wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the 10-year anniversary of the war in Afghanistan. Did anyone see Soraya on the national news on, on the CBC? You know? She, sh she should be on there consistently, and, and Ali and other voices from that community, the community of Afghans that live here in Canada, um, are absolutely shut out of the Canadian media, including our so-called public broadcaster. Um, you know, with the exception of a few who are telling, uh, telling them what they want to hear and telling the Canadian government um, what they want to hear. So, and, and Judith, uh, it's, it's so great to... Uh, to meet you again. I think I first met you at the Vancouver Peace Forums, five year, with the World Peace Forum. That's five years ago now. Um, but we're, you know, we're we're both countries still in Afghanistan, and we both have so much of the same same work to do. Um, the whole way out here from Vancouver uh, on the plane, I, I was thinking um, all about Occupy Wall Street. You know, on the Tim Hortons, trying to wake up. Uh, I almost overslept my flight, uh, so I had to get the Tim Hortons before I got on the plane. Um, the people in front of me were talking about Occupy Wall Street and then waiting for my friend to come through the gates at the Toronto airport uh, again the uh, you know sanitation workers in front of me at the line at Tim Hortons were mentioning the Occupy Wall Street and I was like you know it's happening in Toronto too and they they seemed genuinely interested not just irritated that this guy behind them was uh, <laughs> was eavesdropping and uh, <laughs> you know you know, interjecting with his uh, political fervor, um, but you know, this is this is uh, what people are talking about right now, and I think it's a very, very exciting moment for us. And I know that because I, I'm starting to see that it's a scary, scary moment, or you know, they're they're not used to being afraid um, for the other guys, for the one percent. Um, so I don't know. You've probably been seeing some of the hysterical media coverage about Occupy Wall Street, and you know, at first I was really annoyed or just got really angry. But uh, now it kind of reinforces that feeling that this is something big and this is something important and really hopeful um, when I see, hear the crazy right-wingers. It's not just Fox News, it's that, uh, that right-wing nut bar Kevin O'Leary on yeah. CBC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the nut bar. And I'm not going to, the CBC Ombudsman can accuse me or, you know, can't criticize me for saying nut bar because it's accurate in this case. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so just to give one concrete example, I was listening to CKNW, the, the major talk radio out in British Columbia, uh, the other night, and they, they actually introduced the piece on Occupy Wall Street this way. They said, this thing's been getting so much coverage in the media, we wanted to bring in the other side of the story. <laughs> so to give us that, like I'm not making this up, you can go to the archives online. To bring us the other side of the story, we've got venture capitalist, uh, blah, 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 and longtime Republican voter and fundraiser, um, such and such, in, in California. And listening to this guy was, was really motivating and exciting. So, so the, the radio host asked the guy, well, well give us the other side of it. The, and, and the guy just went into this rant that started off about how it reminded him of the 1960s. And I'm old enough to remember Jane Fonda, you know, sitting on a Vietnamese tank. She was actually with an anti-aircraft gun. But, um, so this guy was ranting about Jane Fonda and how this was all reminiscent of the 1960s. Um, now, just to slow down a bit, I was thinking, you know, if only. Because I don't think we're, we're there yet, but this is the first tremors of, of something uh, really big happening. And we've started to see the, the Hollywood types. I don't know if Fonda's been there, but the Hollywood types, musicians, um, all sorts of people you wouldn't expect kind of aligning themselves now and going down to Wall Street. It's, it's becoming a place to be seen, right? Our movement is becoming a little bit uh, irresistible. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, we've got a ways to go. We've got a ways to go to bring in the anti-war side, the anti-imperialist side of this, right? We want the, the Hollywood progressives and we want the uh, media personalities to be going to Afghanistan with us, with the anti-war movement, to do fact-finding missions, to, to talk to progressive Afghans about what they want um, for their country. And we have a long, long way 
to go to get there. But I think the Occupy Wall Street gives us this wonderful framing. Um, this 99% against the 1%, right? It's what all of us in, a, in our politics, or most of us in our politics, try to say through, through um, you know, it, other words and other, uh, other frameworks. But this is so simple, it, it's almost painful. Um, but it's really captured the imagination. And I think each of our social movements has a, has a big opportunity here, as Judith said, to do popular education using these, these frames of, of the Occupy Wall Street movement. So just thinking on the plane about how this applies to the anti-war movement, well, we know that wars are fought by the 99%, but they're fought in the interests of the 1%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we can look at this for, from the Canadian perspective. We've learned, uh, it's come out, that our top generals and our uh, Minister of Defense, while they're jet-setting around between Tofino and the Caribbean on taxpayer dollars, you know, over the past 10 years, that's what the leadership of this war uh, in Afghanistan, the, the Canadian leadership, that's what, what they spend the bulk of their time doing, whether it's going to hockey games, uh, going to other appearances where they promote the war, or just going on a family vacation. While they're jet-setting around, more than 150 young Canadians have lost their lives in Afghanistan. And more than, you know, more than, um, I don't know how many thousands have been through all the rotations now, but those thousands of young Canadians have also been participating in a war that has killed countless thousands of Afghans. Uh, Canada, unfortunately, we're like Madeleine Albright in the United States. We don't do body counts when it's the, uh, the people we're occupying and uh, committing war crimes against. So this is the 1% and 99%. And uh, we can think about more ways to, uh, to bring that into our analysis when we all march down tomorrow with that banner. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street, not Afghanistan <coughs> banner, which is uh, a beautiful thing, and I hope we're, we're all part of uh, marching it down there tomorrow in Occupy Toronto. Um, if we look at the results of, of the 10 years of war in Afghanistan, I think there's very few here in the Canadian elite that try to make the case that those 10 years have benefited Afghanistan very much, or that the war has succeeded in, terms of, uh, in the terms they had originally set out. But I think we do have to caution ourselves and realize that just because NATO and the U.S. and Canada haven't exactly won in terms of their aims and, and gaining the consent of the population here or in Afghanistan, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that we've won either, and it certainly doesn't mean that the Afghans have won, quite the contrary. Um, they're still suffering um, and still you know, struggling very hard to find a way out of their situation. Um, but I think we do have to step back and realize that the Harper government has won on another, on another battlefront. Not necessarily in Afghanistan, but the war in Afghanistan has helped Harper win very important things here at home. Uh, so I just wanted to take three of them just to put a little downer into my remarks here tonight before I get back to Occupy Wall Street. Um, first of all, when people saw the unveiling of the Winnipeg Jets jerseys. Did, did anyone else see this uh, unveiling? Not the uniform itself, which is disgusting enough. It's a CF-18 fighter jet over top of Maple Leaf, looking a lot like a conservative logo in the uh, blue and red circle. It's directly borrowed from the, from the Air Force, right? Um, the logo. And it also looks a bit like the Conservative Party uh, logo, just a coincidence. Um, well, when they unveiled the new uniforms for this new jersey, for the Winnipeg Jets, the players modeling the new uniforms actually came out through this artificial fog, stepping out of the back of a Hercules uh, transport plane. Uh, I thought they were going to be carrying machine guns instead of hockey sticks, but, you know, this is the cultural, this is the cultural front of the war. And CBC's highest paid media personality, Don Cherry, actually fired a live weapon in Afghanistan and didn't get fired from his job. So this is the cultural front. Um, and this is a topic we'll be getting into tomorrow under the, under the theme of creeping militarism, uh, which the creepy government we live under has really been able to, to advance a lot. Um, and we have to take stock of that and think of creative ways to fight back. Um, politically, they, they've, they've won a political debate largely within the ruling elite uh, of Canada. This debate between whether the Canadian military posture uh, or sort of image that they project should primarily be a peacekeeping image or a war fighting image. Um, this is a transformation that started before the Harper government uh, under the Liberals. Um, 
you know, it, it started along with the war on terror. Um, but I think the war in Yugoslavia was, was part of it as well, but it accelerated in the war on terror years. And then in 2006, when Harper came in, the very first feature interview he did with Peter Mansbridge on The National, when he was asked about Afghanistan, he didn't talk about the war, uh, the battlefield um, dynamics or how the war was going. He said, the war in Afghanistan is making Canada a better country. It's yeah. making the Canadian forces a, a, better, a better army by being involved in killing and directly involved in counterinsurgency. So, and there are other <coughs> political gains that have been won. Um, partly a debate, like I say, within the Canadian elite about how to um, project the image of themselves, but also um, this, this comes down to military hardware. And, and the fact is that the Harper government, even though they sort of have to prolong the war in Afghanistan in a backhanded, under the table kind of way, they have to do it sneakily so that people think we've left Afghanistan, right? Um, They've been very upfront and very successful at pushing the acquisition of new military hardware, which will affect Canadian, um, you know, the budget and the overall direction of the Canadian economy for many, many years to come. And this is where I think uh, Judith's point about linking movements is so critical. Um, the Canadian Peace Alliance has a new campaign, which we're sort of launching through this convention. Um, it's called Peace and Prosperity, Not War and Austerity. Um, so everyone pick up those postcards and, and learn that slogan. Maybe we'll chant it on the way down uh, to the occupation tomorrow. Um, but I think that really gets to, to the point of the alliances that need to be built, and in many cases rebuilt, to once again have a powerful um, anti-war movement in Canada. Um, our, my friend uh, uh, Roger from Haiti Solidarity, who will be presenting tomorrow, um, alerted me to, uh, he was recently in Halifax, he alerted me to the work of the Peace Coalition there in um, fighting back against the major shipbuilding program uh, that the Canadian government has allotted, is it 25 billion? 35 billion dollars they're going to spend over the next generation uh, rearming the Canadian Navy through a massive shipbuilding program. Now, during the federal election, there was a lot of talk and even a lot of opposition to the fighter jets acquisitions. Um, but all parties, we have to say, were united in, uh, in backing the shipbuilding program, often under this excuse that it would create Canadian jobs. Um, to kill other people. So we, to kill other people, exactly. So this is the, this is the fundamental question. And um, is Tamara here this year? Tamara Lawrence from the Halifax Peace Coalition? Okay, I'll quote her then, since she wasn't able to join us. Um, uh, Tamara Lawrence of the Halifax Peace Coalition <laughs> captures in a quote about the opposition to the shipbuilding in, in, in Halifax. Um, I, think, I think she captures perfectly where our movements need to go uh, and where the most strategic line is in terms of influencing um, the overall fight back against Harper and this overall movement, which is swelling around North America and is really going international that is addressing that 1%, 99% difference. Um, and starting to, starting to have a real conversation about the fundamentals about what the, the, the economy that we live under is and what the economic system underlying that is. So uh, Tamara says, do we really want, as she asks, do we really want our next generation workforce building warships and naval combat systems? Imagine instead are young people proudly employed, retrofitting, retrofitting homes, installing clean energy technologies, expanding public transportation, upgrading wastewater treatment systems, running organic farms, and restoring polluted rivers? So that is really the question over the next generation. Will we take a trajectory down this war economy, this oil economy with the tar sands expansion, um, and then fighting wars abroad? Or will we take a trajectory of keeping the oil in the ground, stop fighting wars abroad for oil and other resources, and really investing in green jobs, in ethical jobs, uh, if you will, in jobs that create the kind of society that doesn't plunder um, the earth. So thinking about that, I, I, I think we should um, have a friendly addition to the peace and prosperity, not war and austerity slogan. And like I said, I was kind of groggy today, um, so this doesn't exactly rhyme, but <laughs> something along the lines of green jobs, not jets, ships, and more bombs.
you know, <laughs> it's, it's got some work to do. Uh, uh, we've all got some work to do, you can help me out on that slogan, but I think when we're presenting the alternatives, we have to get at that ecological question, the question of what, what work are people going to have if we, if, we, if we hopefully dismantle the military industrial complex, dismantle the tar sands climate change producing complex, complex. We have to have alternatives, and I think there's a lot of movements out there thinking about these questions. And uh, you know, the occupations, if they go on for weeks, these campouts as, as they're projected to be, just like Occupy Wall Street, what a great place to go and have little impromptu workshops and just talk to others who are thinking about these questions. Um, yeah, getting back to Occupy Wall Street, um, it's just an incredibly exciting time. Uh, it's, it's fun to be in Toronto, again, last time I was here was the G20, so, um, and that was, that was before Rob Ford was the mayor, so everybody in all the political groups you have ties to and all your friends and, and family, people really better be putting on the heat on, uh, is it still Blair, did he not lose his job? Still Blair, okay. Um, the police chief, uh, people really better be watching and, and be vigilant uh, against police repression of this new movement and all the protests, whatever form they take. We all have to stand united against crackdowns on civil liberties, uh, especially in the wake of the G20. Um, and I think, one last point on the Occupy Walls, oh, Chris is giving me head. Um, but I thought, you know, the war on terror has been the ultimate public-private partnership it's been a 10 year long bailout and just subsidy to this military industrial complex. Um, so that, that's the best reason I can think of to occupy Bay Street, not Afghanistan. Uh, I've got to wrap up now. Uh, look, look forward to, to all your questions. Thanks again.